gentlemen, good evening. It's a pleasure to welcome you all this evening to our first session of Trendspotting. I'm going to leave the introduction of today's session and the panelists to Shashank Veera, but before that, a few words about Shashank himself. Shashank Veera is chairman of the Hearth Advisors Group, a research-led advisory organization based out of Europe and Asia. Shashank has three decades of experience as an educator, entrepreneur, and social infrastructure financier. Transporting the Hearth Lecture Series is a collaborative effort of the India Habitat Center and the Hearth Advisors Group. The series brings us monthly discussions about an evolving future. These will connect the frontiers, frontiers of academia, research, societal concerns, technology, and evolving thought with issues that matter to people's lives. Over now to Shashank to take the evening forward and tell you a little more about today's session and introduce the panelists. Please welcome Shashank Veera. Uh, good evening and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, can I request if you could uh, turn your mobile phones onto silent mode, please? Right, if you haven't already done so, um, just so that it doesn't interrupt our discussions today. Okay, uh, uh, thanks to Vidyun and the Habitat Center for uh, partnering with us on this series, which will be a monthly series. And Transporting is really a series about looking at uh, aspects of life which are changing, evolving, and the future may not be exactly like the, what the present is in these spaces. And we're gonna try and connect these discussions back into why it matters and why it's important to us in the present, right? So transporting is really about the future and the present, right, on it. And these will be monthly series, and uh, I hope you enjoy them. Right. Over to the discussion for today, right? I'd like to first introduce our panelists, right? Uh, I'll begin from one side. Uh, Dr. Anupma Malik is uh, the chairperson of Visara Tech. Uh, this is an IIT Delhi spin-off. It was incubated in IIT Delhi, and uh, uh, you'll hear during the discussion about some of the interesting areas of work that have spun off from this um, uh, startup. And it, it does a lot of work in edtech, which is not just about content and devices, read on it. So it's about extending what edtech can be beyond content and devices. Uh, to my immediate right is Shikhar Malhotra, and Shikhar wears several hats. He's, uh, and I don't know which order to introduce you, Shikhar, but he's, um, I think what's closest to his heart, I think is the fact that um, he set up the Shivnadar schools. Right, and over the past decade has taken them to where they are today. Uh, amongst various other things, he's also Chancellor of Shivnath University. Uh, he does have his hat in the investment and big business world. He's a director of ACL Tech. He's set up lots of, with relevance to today's conversations, ed tech companies invested in them. But much more importantly, I think, Shikhar, and I'm gonna ask you about that in a while, is really about chosen not to invest in various others, right? And had the discrimination to look at what works and what doesn't, and take a judgment call as an investor about what punt you're gonna take on the future, right? Um, on my immediate left is Sabina Devan. She's the president of the Just Jobs Network. And the Just Jobs Network is a unique think tank which does work on employability and things that matter in the workforce. Right. She has very strong views on technology, and uh, I'm hoping that she does express them right, on it. Um, and she's done work on actually looking at uh, the labor force and how it is the way it is and the trends in the future on it. Uh, and to the extreme left is Dr. Jagjit Kaur, and she's a postdoc fellow at Ashoka University, but in a very interesting center, right on it. And this center is a center that looks at digitization, AI, and society, right? And that's a really, again, interesting perspective on ed tech, right? So that's the panel. The way we're gonna run this today is that we're going to have a discussion, which I hope you'll find interesting, for about 
45 minutes or so. And then we'll open the floor to questions that you might have of the panel. Um, and we'll do that for another bit of time until uh, our time runs out or people get bored of it. Right, Anand? So without further ado, I'm going to actually ask all four of you um, the same question right, on it. And I'm going to try and randomize how I ask it of you so you don't know how much time you're going to get to answer it. Um, but I want to look at the problem statement first. Right? And I want to look at the problem statement about what is the problem in education or research right, that artificial intelligence is in a unique place to solve. Right? So it's really about, right, are we just, we have the technology, so let's use it? Or is artificial intelligence really the solution to a particular problem in this space? Right, Anand? So, Shikhar, what about you? Yeah. Um, thanks for having me here, Shashank. <coughs> so, <coughs> I think if I expand the, the question a bit, EdTech and artificial intelligence, so it's not just you know limited to, let's say, artificial intelligence. It gives a bit more of a canvas to, to address. Um, I think, you know, living in India, uh, we've obviously been, you know, bombarded by the EdTech articles, stories, and all of this stuff over the last three years. So in a sense, you know, maybe the EdTech stuff has sort of been over-marketed a bit. But we shouldn't also get myopic that what we see as the obvious things is the definition of EdTech. Um, there's a whole universe of EdTech, uh, and I'd, I'm assuming uh, there are a lot of people here primarily from high school to primary education. Right? Yeah, and okay. also university. University as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the solutions are working differently depending on the age group, right? And uh, my observation is that uh, the solutions work significantly better as the age group gets older. Um, so, uh, you know, I also sit on um, the advisory board for Babson, and I was, and they were telling us basically what's happened through the COVID period and in terms of applications. Um, you can't deny that the interest, right, around uh, online education and ed tech has just absolutely catapulted for higher education. So the number of applications they get for their MB for their online programs about eight times what they get for the regular master's program, and that's not slowing. So. I think that's uh, symptomatic of also the larger things that are happening in the world that a lot of people don't want to give up their jobs. Uh, they find that they can avail the same thing um, by, you know, with, and, and they're quite okay to give up part of the on-campus and in-person experience knowing that they'll get the education. Or th they feel that, you know, they'll get a similar education um, and they don't have to give it up, you know, and it goes into a larger conversation about basically cost going up and a lot of those things. So can they really afford to sort of give it up? So there's a surge there, and obviously there are a lot of companies out there that are capitalizing on that surge, and they really want to make the most of it. So they're tuning a lot of solutions uh, and using a lot of artificial intelligence on areas like analytics. Uh, so again, the reason I said sometimes we get a bit myopic is because we think it's just about content, but there's a massive universe actually out there around analytics, remote learning, uh, teacher-enabling tools, right? And a lot of this is basically wired through artificial intelligence. Um, when it comes down to content, it becomes a lot more controversial because you're not just, you know, your stakeholder is not just a student anymore, it's also the parent, right? When it's sort of at the back end, um, the stakeholders are less visible. So you're talking about educators uh, and obviously students to some extent as well. Um, I think that it's a, it's a mixed bag because uh, we tend to sort of exaggerate, you know, some of the, uh, the positives around it. I really like what I see actually in some of the solutions out there. Uh, we use a lot of it, we've invested in some of it. Um, and you know, we try to invest in stuff which has a lot more substance and not very gimmicky. Uh, so I think, you know, look, we've all uh, been through the COVID period. We all know we've been over marketed to, right? By uh, during that time. And so we've all been bombarded by a lot of these ads and you know, things like what it can claim to do. Uh, but the stuff that we've not really seen is the enabling tools because those are more selling to institutions. And so you don't get to see a lot of that stuff. But, uh, but some of those tools are just incredible, right? And um, I've seen actually how they can enable a lot of campuses, they can digitize campuses, they can, suddenly you've got data on your fingertips which you never really knew. It would take you like days basically to gather some of this information. 
and uh, you know I can give a list of some of these names, but I don't want to advertise them. Okay. Yep. Um, but we have, but we have uh, taken a look at it. We've deployed them, and so sometimes what we do is we have the advantage before we even look to invest. We said, okay, let's try these guys out, right, and see how they they measure up. We really like what we see, and when we don't like it, you know, we basically, uh, you know, we say that you know this is this stuff is a bit gimmicky, so the the claims are sort of exaggerated. But we want to partner with people that have a lot more substance in the long run. And um, I really like actually, so I've gone through three uh, waves of COVID in my mind. I've gone through uh, intrigue, then I've gone through hype, and I'm coming back to intrigue, right? Um, so I sort of, so I felt that the hype period was just crazy for the last like, um, last one year. But I really like what I'm seeing in the last three months. So I think what's happened is the dust has settled a bit. And now people are able to compartmentalize that these are content guys, uh, these are analytics guys, these are maybe remote learning guys. So there's a bit of maturity uh, gradually coming into the space. So if you just keep an eye on it, you'll see more and more of that. Thanks, Shikhar. I mean, that's that's uh, really well put. And you know, I'm going to take it to Anupma. And, and, and Anupma and IIT Delhi, right on it, have you seen the kind of stuff that Shikhar is talking about uh, being used widely? Uh, and of course, your own views on what's the problem that EdTech and AI is actually trying to fix. Uh, again, thanks for having me here, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, what Chika says about uh, the fact that EdTech is so much more than AI is there, but we are now at a question where it says that how is AI going to really solve a problem of education or research? And what you asked me specifically is if in IIT I see in a kind of uh, applicability of what he said. So I'll go back to a little bit, you know, talking of when you said problem of education. Uh, you know, first is that I think the goal of education is one, to have an educated populace, is learning, of course. Ultimately, our goal is to have people who, who are learned. And also, of course, for everyone who's at in a higher education is to be looking at a career, I think, to be employed and uh, you know have a career that they want or not in their life so ai is, is you know in i was discussing this with sabina earlier as well that you know ai can be used in many ways i mean there is a whole set of stuff i did actually my phd was in artificial intelligence so yeah. i can go on about that but what i want to stick to this is that you know typically ai is about crunching data and giving analysis you are making a machine think like a human and here you have the uh, capability which is you know multiple multiple times right because the machine is able to store so much more than maybe a human mind one single human mind can so if ai can do that then ai is able to uh, uh, solve one major problem which i think is of unemployability i think uh, sabina will probably m talk more of this but according to me we look at it very differently so how does you know, typically AI tools are being used in today in hiring. So whether it's agencies, recruiters, platforms, portals, algorithms, all are moving towards finding the best fit for a job, yeah. right? So on one hand, you have a huge database of candidates, applicants who have skills, you know, whether they're educational skills or skills that they have experience-wise. And on the other hand, you have uh, the job descriptions as to what is required. And typically, hiring is solved by finding the best fit. Okay, but are we really trying to solve hiring, or are we trying to solve unemployability? Is the question that I would like to talk of. And I think AI can really help there because it can crunch data like anything. So instead of why don't we reverse engineer rather than using AI to find the best fits for the jobs, why don't we find the right education to give for the jobs that is required today? And this is changing. It's a changing um, arena completely. And it is going to be so huge. So job descriptions, let me put it my way. I mean, for my particular, I, I run a firm where we uh, digitize heritage. Okay, So I'm looking for a coder who could be uh, writing software for a VR application where I want to take the user of that VR experience to Hampi. So there is a requirement for me of a person who can write software who understand, of course, has a basis of maths and uh, logical thinking, to having a design, a creative mind, because he's going to immerse a user into a virtual world. 
So how do I match this? And if I go out looking, I find three people. I have to make them work together, and I have to find you know that right solution which comes out of this. But I really need this one person. And how does my institute, who's training, or the school which is teaching, be able to figure this out? And AI can really help that. AI can find all kind of required skills, put them into these slots, and say that look, this is what you need to teach. So my <laughs> one two-bit point here is that we need to look at a reverse engineering of how to find the people for the right jobs that yeah, there are today, and it can be very exciting. And so Sabina, I have to bring you in on that. Right on it. It would be an obvious segue into you. Uh, what do you think about that? Is AI the solution to all that you've been working on for the last 20 years? Yeah. Well, you, you set me up very well for yeah. this, uh, Shashank, and I have a lot to say, but I'll start with this question about what, uh, what solutions does technology and AI have to offer? And I, here I think, and you might be surprised to hear me say this, but I do actually believe that technology is an enabler in education. And I do actually believe that technology can be a solution for several uh, uh, kinds of tasks that we have in education or as Anupama brought up in, in the labor market. So what are the kinds of things? Um, school management and big data, both Shikhar and Anupama have talked about this. I mean, technology gives us the ability to analyze big data and have analytics in a way that we haven't been able to have. Collaboration and communication much faster across longer distances, right? Uh, and then while content creation can be controversial, as Shikhar, men Shikhar mentioned, uh, technology does enable content creation and access, right? So, so all of, in all of those ways, I think both tech and AI are conducive to these processes. Technology is also a huge enabler when it comes to large scale, and this is big for India, right? We have 365 million people between the ages of 15 to 29, which is larger than any other individual industrialized country in the world. Just that segment, right? We need scale. We need to be able to implement certain processes that can deal with large numbers of people and potentially provide solutions to large numbers of people. Now, here's the rub, right? There's always a but. Uh, first of all, technology solutions don't fit all, right? We have a very heterogeneous population, and the people that we are talking about here are not generally the ones that can access, uh, are the ones that can access tech solutions. We have a large contingent that don't, right? 13% of uh, young people drop out um, at ninth or 10th grade. We've all read the ESSER studies that talk about the poor quality of education. If you look at technology access, um, I think the number is, let me just find so I don't mess this up, uh, 26, only 26% 26 of women actually own a smartphone and 14% actually use the internet, right? So we've got a huge digital divide, we've got a large population with low levels of education, uh, poor quality of education, dropouts. And we cannot expect that technology and ed tech is going to be the solution for them. Uh, we need to be careful about how we deploy technology, right? I like to say that India is an assisted technology country. We can't just give people a device and say, go learn. We can give them a device, sit with them, teach them how to use it, and then have a human interface throughout the process that enables them to actually use technology productively. Otherwise, we're going to just exacerbate inequality, which is bad for everyone, right? Uh, two more quick points on this technology as a solution and, and my but. The problem is that we can't look at artificial intelligence in a vacuum, right? So yes, there are many positive applications, as both Anupama and Shikhar have talked about, in terms of the application of AI in education and its potential. But if we unleash the AI genie unregulated, it has all kinds of problems from you know, we know that these are based on algorithms that, and as Anupama was saying, numbers, right? So let's say someone comes up with a incorrect uh, statistic. Everybody remembers that the statistic that there's one million people that enter the workforce every year. Do you all remember that? That was rampant. Not true. 
right? It's actually one million working age population. People enter the working age population, which is very different than how many people actually enter the labor force. In fact, labor force participation has been declining. Now, an AI, AI algorithm would pick up that statistic and throw it out to anyone that asked for it. And it would perpetuate a lie. It would perpetuate misinformation, right? So, you know, there's that. There's all these issues around uh, AI being used to fight wars and, you know, cybersecurity. There's a ton of issues that we obviously aren't going into in this conversation. So what I'm trying to say is that while AI might have some positive applications in education, and that's what we're here to talk about today, we cannot think about AI in a vacuum just in terms of education. This is a bigger, larger, meaner force that we really have to think about how we regulate in all spheres, including education. I'll stop there. Thanks, Sabina. And, and, and that's actually a perfect segue into Jagjit, because you know, Jagjit, we're all amateurs here. You actually do this for a living. Right? You connect the dots on everything that we've been talking about. Right? And how would you respond to Sabina and the others about um, this? Is it this dangerous genie that is going to devour us or is it the next hope that's going to lead us to this golden future? Thank you for your question, Shashanji. So, uh, so I've worked on edtech for my doctoral work, and this is where this comes from. Uh, you know, why are we discussing this question? Right. This is the basic thing. Like, why are we talking about edtech in the present times as a thing that would be a hope for future or something that has problems? It is because it is look like Sabina said. It is located in history, right? This emerged somewhere in the developed nations when there was a military corporate nexus of kind of proliferating technologies out there in the world. And that is how India also adopted it in the 1980s and 90s from there. And then there was a combination of, you know, education kind of getting combined with this uh, technology kind of thing. And you thought that, you know, ed tech will now uh, kind of solve all the problems in the world. So I was reading a book uh, which was written in 1980s. and. We are still, you know, talking about this in the Indian context. And in 1980s, in that book, it's, uh, uh, I can't recall the name. I'll probably, you know, kind of find out and tell you later. But that writer mentions in the 1980s that this kind of hope that we are discussing for ed tech now, because uh, something that we keep saying that technology will solve everything out there in the world, kind of emerged when there was depression in the developed nations in UK and US. And to kind of combat that economic depression, the governments thought that you know now technology will be kind of a thing which will go uh, give give hope to the people. So this is this has an economic context to it from where this is coming from. And also uh, adding to this, we should also think about in the realm of edtech what is technology and why do we need it in education? Like this pencil is a technology, and this emerged sometime you know in history, and this kind of helped us write better. So when we are talking about ed tech, we should also think where is this coming from and what solutions in education are we looking at? Going from there to the next step, uh, in the schools and the higher education system, there are basically two realms. One is the administrative part of it and one is the learning part of it. So if you see the administrative part of it, quite a number of uh, people are happy with what is happening through ed tech. So it has been able, like you can digitize libraries through it, you can kind of, uh, develop LMS systems through it. So that can, uh, that is something that can be easily done and that is making work easy for people in the realm of education. But if you move on to the learning front, there are question marks on all kinds of technologies that are coming in. So to give you an example, I was at a fair where there were many ed tech solutions that were being put up. And there was a solution uh, which I'll just share. So there was a man sitting with his uh, you know, device and this was like a KBC uh, you know, game. So he said that this can be used for assessment, which means that uh, you, know, you will be given four options and you have a remote in your hand and you quickly say, okay, one, two, or three, or four is right. And uh, you know, it wasn't getting sold because this is, this is not contextual to how examinations happen in the schools or in the college systems. So you, know, you have to devise solutions which are, uh, which are central to the problems in education. And, uh, Lastly, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, I was at a conference recently and there was, uh, uh, you know, a lady discussing uh, AI and ed, 
tech in medical, in the field of you know, uh, medicine and pharmacy. And what she was saying that you should be using tech along with the human intervention so that you know, things can become faster, so that you can kind of uh, bring out patterns uh, you know, that uh, it takes a lot of time for humans to kind of get to. So technology can probably kind of fasten that process and then with the human intervention you can be better at solving medical problems. Now the question to us should be what are we trying to do through edtech? So I mean th this then directly connects with the education goals that we have in our mind. So what is it that we are looking through edtech should be the core uh, to what you know uh, solutions or valorization or critique that we see for edtech. Thank you. Thanks, Jagjit. Um, there've been I mean uh, four different perspectives uh, on on the same aspect about red what exactly edtech is and AI are leading towards. And, and uh, you know, the first thing I'd ask you before we take the um, conversation forward, is there anything that you've heard that any of you would like to react to right, that um, any of the others have said? And um, anything you'd like to react to right away? Right? No, so every, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, absolutely. I, I'm just curious, a show of hands in the audience of how many people would go to a doctor for surgery that had just acquired their medical education through online sources, the best online sources from Harvard or whatever university you can think of as the top-notch medical. You wouldn't, right? You wouldn't, would you? So let's put this in perspective. Sorry, I know I'm being a bit facetious, but yeah. I think these kinds of, you know, when we're pushing these technological solutions, you know, we can talk about it specifically. I can talk about the shop floor mechanic who we say, oh, you know, just, do an, uh, just do an online course and then go fix a car, that's fine. But when we unleash the genie again, what are the different applications of this? It's, it's, you know, you need, so I'm not saying don't do it, I'm saying regulate it so that we don't end up in these situations where, you know, these, these situations that might seem out, outlandish to us today but are actually possible if we, if we don't control this situation now. Because let me take it on from where Sabina said that, right, so, so we're not gonna go to a doctor who's just learned everything they know f from an online course. I so we, know. yeah, and uh, so, so how do we know, which is a really great thing. <laughs> so uh, should online certification be different? But uh, if we know and we are not gonna go, and that's probably a bad use of ed tech, right, on it. Let me turn the question around to say, in what context, right, have you seen ed tech, which is which actually works, which says in this context, um, you know, I I have a physics background. I can say that there are lots of simulations in physics where you're trying to either slow down time or go into spaces that you couldn't otherwise go, which without technology it would be very difficult to visualize or model. Or um, uh, is that ed tech? Is any simulation ed tech? No, so just going back, I think uh, a doctor who's got his degree from an online course will not get it unless he's had, you know, practice first. It has to be hybrid. Yeah. It could not have been just that he studied and he got his degree. Okay, that so, so if I can just generalize so from what Sabina and uh, Anupma, you guys have said is, so one of the things we should insist on is that equivalent standards on whether you do it online or offline, whether you use it doing using technology or not, don't compromise on standards, outcome standards. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, and human interface. And human interface, right? But uh, you know, uh, so I think that when we think of edtech, we we often think of it to be this sort of didactic one-way online tool. But if I take the medical example, um, I've actually seen like the Johns Hopkins Training Center, and they use a lot of ed tech actually in simulation, right? So there's deployment of it. I don't know, would you classify it as ed tech or would you classify that as, let's say, a training tool? But the point is, yeah, th but it's, but they've got these um, live models with like, you know, about 250 sensors in it, right? So you press the wrong rib and you press this and, you know, suddenly yeah. it goes off. This is actually very, f you know, these things cost like $200,000, right? And so there's serious investment that goes into that. But then I suppose that's also a classic uh, point that you know, I'm just trying to make is that you can use that as an enabling tool for a lot of these trainings 
So that simulation actually is, uh, it's, it's par for the course now, right? At the best yeah. medical schools everywhere in the world. Because, you know, okay, not every country's got 1.4 billion people. So they don't have a choice but to create these solutions, right? We can create, you know, uh, live, programs, live, right? Yeah, live. <laughs> right? And so they've, you know, th they find it hard to to do all of, all of that. So I, I, I mean, I think both are right, right? And exactly what they're saying. And then there are these examples of using it as enabling tools. So I, uh, back I to you, Anupma. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I wanted yeah. to just carry on on that. So one thing is in medical field. I think one of the most difficult things that people find are, uh, are uh, uh, cadavers to operate on and to practice on. And simulation actually gives you all kind of possibilities. So I have spoken to doctors and I've spoken of AR and VR, which is what we normally are looking at. And they really, really need these kind of simulated environments for their doctors to get trained on. Otherwise, I mean, Indian doctors get trained on on masses. So you go to AIMS and the best doctors, why do you find them there? Because they are operating on you know so many cases. But if that is not the case in a remote area in India, and they are able to do their practice through simulation and an, you know technology enablement, then that person in that remote area will be as good as a doctor in AIMS. And yes, 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 because of the fact that you can, through technology, simulate absolutely the kind of issues that may have come up, which can, and you do not, it cadavers, is, it's expensive to get that kind of technology environments, labs, etc. and I think, at tech when you are saying what else it is doing, it is taking this education to masses. So when we are talking of during COVID times, I know that it was difficult. There was an equalizer in terms of the schools where children had tablets and mobile phones mm -hmm. to the, you know, uh, uh, to people, to kids who were in slums. They did get access to mobile phones. They, in remote areas, I know in Himachal, there were kids who were able to get and I think at that point of time, there was an equalizer. I won't say the content and the faculty was as good, but everybody was able to reach out to people. And I think we all learned something through there <laughs> is that disbursement is possible to the remotest and to that one individual who may not be able to go to a school. He could sit at home and actually access content and uh, you know the learning was there. Now, of course, and human interface cannot be taken away, I agree. A one-to-one -one learning, I've been a teacher as well. And I know that I'd like to look at my student. I'd like to see whether that even anything is going in. And mm -hmm. he would probably like to, you know, and we talk of other things only and not just content. But I think disbursement is a big thing that can be taken care of through edtech. And uh, yes, AI there can help because it can tune it to an individual. I'll come to that maybe a little later. Yeah. Uh, so two, two quick points just, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to make takeaways in my own head as we're going along. Uh, one, an example that I don't know, you know, people of um, my generation used to do dissections on frogs, and it was terrible. You had to pin this frog and do dissections on it. You know, all of you who are my generation would remember that, right, on it. An absolutely, absolutely terrible thing. And uh, people in Shora's generation or Kunal's generation have never heard of this mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? They did it all through simulations. And this was in normal CBSC, ISC, High schools, and right? The frog you know, we're would not. Wake up in the middle of the. <laughs> the frog would wake up in, in the middle, middle of the, yeah, and yes. terrible, terrible. I don't <laughs> want to even even think about those. But uh, you know, the point I'm um, trying to make is that you've got one end where you have the Johns Hopkins simulations, which are incredibly complex and, and, and extremely well crafted, and then you've got uh, the fact that you know nobody is screaming for us to go back to frog dissections, right? On it. Um, and so there are levels and levels at which simulations have worked, right? So just generalizing that point that, yes, the high tech, really expensive, really superb simulations are one end of the spectrum, and then you've got the mass end of the spectrum as well, which has come in. Um, but the other point that I want to just generalize from what you know, the various panelists have said is that ed tech is not just about a tutorial prep program for getting in better marks in an exam or a test prep for a competitive exam. That's just one thin part of the ed tech market, right on it. And we are talking <coughs> about the ed tech space much, much more broadly today, right on it. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, Anupma. Um, Jagjit, you know, you're at a university which is um, a new modern university. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna come back to you, Shikhar, as well, because you, you're at a new modern university as well, right on it. Um, are you, in your day-to-day -day practices, using uh, technology, uh, or is that just left to individual lecturers and professors? 
okay so at ashoka we do use the basics like the zoom the google meet and all of that but i'll give you an example from uh, you know my research and from the schools on how edtech was used so uh, i was observing a classroom in a school and there is this uh, you know if you have all seen a vr device so uh, there's this you know room set up for these and this is a very high elite you know school in delhi and cr they are trying to show this uh, a forest you know through a vr device to the students and i was talking to the head of you know that organization who was sitting there while th that was happening and i asked him so when the students started seeing that you know in 5 minutes obviously they become very excited right you know because you are kind of coming from a very boring classroom and you are kind of seeing a device which you probably seen in a mall and you know that's a very different kind of engagement and in in 5 minutes and i that response is still in my head that uh, organizations uh, you know owner he told me see this is what we call learning so i was amazed i mean this is not what we call learning i mean excitement is not learning they can probably get excited when they go to a mall right you don't and uh, you cannot replicate an experience of going to a forest through a vr device i mean how is that even possible so uh, there is a barrier in technology uh, you know when you kind of communicate as well through technology so there is already a wall so in my research um, there's this thing that uh, you know when i observe the classroom scenario uh, when when there is no technology involved so there is this square like i am a teacher and there are students there so you know it's like a direct interaction but when there is technology involved the centrality is given to the technology the teacher moves to the side and there are the students so teacher only adds you know a couple of things in the end or only reiterates what the technology is saying so the entire stakeholders have shifted and we are not even thinking about that while we are talking about edtech and the kind of communication has shifted in fact i'll talk about another example from the administrative front the teachers told me that now because you know their phone numbers are there with the parents uh, you know uh, the parents even call them at 11 at night so there is no personal space left for them so uh, that is another kind of you know uh, boundaries that have kind of been crossed which shouldn't be crossed in a school system so all these uh, you know in uh, involvement of the human stakeholders is kind of changing with the technology i think which which should be very much uh, you know thought about while we kind of say on you know what kind of technologies are we bringing to the schools or the universities and i can you know still keep adding about the smart yeah. board later on no i i have to take that back to anupma of course right on it anupma you know we've had a conversation in the past where you've talked about all the um, um really interesting tech on ar vr that you've used and uh, uh, uh you know how would you respond to that's that's one but the second bit is also what the conversation we had about the pushback from schools and the education system about what they want to use and what they don't want to use where you were surprised at the kind of things that they chose to use and the things they just weren't interested in so first uh, i think kids being excited about anything in a classroom is actually a point of excitement according to me because uh, getting kids excited about learning is i think the first barrier removed first because what is typically happened is kids just remember their school jana hai class hoga we'll take the lesson nobody is interested what the teacher is saying they are all interested in the break and then they i mean finish their school and come back and then it's fun time so if you could get a kid excited about being in school going to school through a vr ar device first it's that is good but yes that is not the complete learning you are absolutely right being inside a forest and him getting excited doesn't mean that he's learned anything but what happens is that through the use of these kind of tools all you are doing is getting that little bit of uh you know disruptive uh thing in about that learning can happen in this manner as well so if you if you remember you had good teachers or you didn't have good teachers right so i remember all my teachers very well there were some with whom we could interact they could tell us stories and through those story tellings i think we learned the concept those i remember the most right rest of it i learned on my own i just had to do rote learning and i had to go and put it out in my exam and i was i could be a top student but today i mean this is has to change because one there is so much of information we only knew you know only our course we are now studying science or social science and this now you have a mix uh, in fact liberal arts has brought this very good concept 
but the information is also too much what do i learn how much do i learn how do you decide that that's so tough for the students so if they could get excited about one of the things that takes off i think that would be a great way of being able to find out what excites you and what could take you there now in schools when we took uh, we did take vr so what we let's say we put up an exhibition in national museum and this was all about we simply created replicas of monuments they were 3d printed replicas and you could interact with them in many ways you could play games you could actually listen to stories you could do several things with this is history now typically who comes to national museum are you know much older people people who are art enthusiasts or who are and they brought schools there now schools came in their typical queues these students saying oh we have to go to this museum and they entered and when they entered the gallery by the time they moved out the whole thing had changed they wanted to actually go back only because of the fact that there was still history being let's say learned there they were talking seeing heritage half of them wanted to go to the sites they actually did want to go to hampi or you know konark which they knew nothing about only because they played a game by which they won something so i think that experiential learning i think it's already there in the nep it's already there in uh, g20 experiential learning whether it's done by a teacher through a human interface or through technology is going to be the disruptive way to be able to teach and learn now teachers have to learn more that is a little problem because these are tools so the problem is that teachers will find it difficult how to make it more engaging and maybe technology can come in there so a teacher who sits through her class showing slides to students is not going to get much outcome but if those slides have something which excites the student to learn on his or her own it's going to be good i'll pick out a replica and show here yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah. i did bring this yeah so i asked um, oh, her to bring out so. stuff about you know and this is all 3d printed yeah. stuff you can she can, she'll put it there you yeah, can you have can a look at it right on it so yeah yeah so you all may have seen been to hampi and seen the stone chariot it's on a 100 rupee note by the way this is the stone chariot which is in hampi now one just had to go and digitize uh, it and then make 3d replicas and they are available the moment i take it to any school or any uh, you know class or any this thing it just i think there is no way that they don't want to go to hampi or learn more about it lo learn about vijayanagar dynasty or art architecture what are these you know why are these wheels here what all is here so it's all uh, i think it's all about the fact of how you take use the tech they have rightly said but why not use it <laughs> in this these manners you know so we are because we are engineers so what we did was we created a hole here so that you could point a torch light and when you look in you will find that there is inside of it is also there is lot of carving and uh, stuff now the curiosity is when you go to hampi you will not be able to do this but when you take this to kids now they would want to really find out more and i think that is what we are all uh, ultimately uh, looking at to have curiosity built up and have critical thinking come in so the questions we them ask is how would you build something like this can you go and do this can you use you know the fact of taking photos creating 3d models and doing 3d printing why not now again the point will come is there will be schools which will be able to do it and there will be government schools which will not be able to do it but i must say that because i work a lot with the government there is a huge push with the nep coming in of taking this kind of things to the you know schools which are government schools which are run by the government which are state level or central level government schools and i think this will really be a disruptive thing i'm sorry i said too much no uh, shikhar <laughs> i'm going to take it to you because you actually run a number of institutions right on it at the school level at the uh, university level right and uh, so you've got a couple of universities under your belt and you've got several schools right um in your experience over the last 10 years what works and what doesn't um okay so very some very quick examples right uh, the shivnara school um has the privilege of trying things out and uh, you know the students are generally come from a well to do background we do have quite a few economically weaker section students there as well um but you know what we do is we create an equalizer so we actually spend more on our ews students than we do on uh a fee paying students so that uh you know they're because we we acknowledge that they're sort of behind the curve but um the hit rate is pretty high there okay but if i take the example of let's say uh, vidyagyan which is this other social school that we run um 
so what happened during COVID was, uh, you know, we were fed this story that, uh, uh, I'll start with the negative and then the positive, right? So that we were fed this story that uh, online has made this accessible to everyone. So now the entire India is connected. And I like, uh, I think Sabina made that point about uh, smartphones, right? Uh, being what, a 27% of the population, right? So what, so what we did is, we did a survey, firstly, how many of them have a smartphone? And we had about 2,000 uh, students that come from villages and they're going back home and you know we run a leadership academy for them. So uh, we were pretty determined that you know the education's got to continue, it can't stop. So we got them devices, we sent it, you know, we got them delivered and you know the whole of India was operating that way, it was working pretty well. Uh, but there were three distinct issues that we didn't really realize and these are important because if you were gonna take the solution, let's say to the masses, right? The first is um, power is not continuous. So, you know, and these phones, are, by the way, not very expensive, right? These aren't iPhones where you can watch movies for like three hours. You know, they heat up, okay, they shut off, and uh, you gotta charge them, and there's just no power, right? So what do you do? If there's no power, there's no phone, there's no phone, there's no learning, there's no attack. And uh, the second learning was remarkable, that the average number of people in a single household was like about 800. Okay, I'm, I'm joking, it wasn't 800, but it felt like that, because you could hear, it was used to be about like literally 12 or 13 people, right? So it was a lot of people inside the house. Now, you know, this one individual has to then learn with a lot of this noise, and then of course what ends up happening is that because you've got this tool, other people want to share it, and you know, it's not that easy, right? So these are like the real brass tag sort of issues. Um, and so, sorry? I said yeah. they are important. They are, yeah, super important. And so, and then we asked them, so how was the experience? And they said it sucked, okay? So they said this experience wasn't great at all. And they said they're super happy to come back to, to school. So I'm trying to visualize that if you multiply this, let's say by millions of people, right? So you can't truly just take a device and you know plonk it in there and think that you know you've created that access. And you know, firstly, this was a phone too; it wasn't a laptop, right? So because laptops are a lot more expensive. Um, but uh, you know, I saw that there were experiments that didn't quite work there, at least on remote learning. But they work brilliantly inside the classroom. So even at the Shivnata School, uh, you know, we've had LMSs from day one. We're using a lot of tools around analytics now. And uh, we like the idea of customized learning. We want to know where each student is in the learning journey. So we don't try to compartmentalize it. We said, if we know where they are in the learning journey, here's where they'll collaborate together. So it's basically their sort of unison and collaboration. And then here's where they'll sort of learn at their own pace so that, uh, you know, they're not, nobody, nobody's far too ahead of the curve. Well, if they're far too ahead of the curve, it's a good thing they can be customized. But if they're behind the curve, you need to know who's there so it's live, right? Because half the time, you know, the information you get is too little, too late, and, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? And the teacher's ultimate dilemma is what do I do with a student that's, uh, that's not kept uh, faced with the, uh, with the syllabus. So I think, you know, two paradoxical examples. I think resources do make a difference. So Shivnata School works pretty well, uh, but then, you know, we looked at these other schools, and we had limitations on what we could do outside the school, but inside the school it actually worked very, very well. So, um, yeah, that's the long and short of it. Yeah, I'm going to bring it back to the panel, but I'm going to throw it open to the house right now and get a few questions in and then bring it back to the four of you for uh, winding up thoughts and things. Yes, Samir. Yeah. I think the online courses uh, by various institutions have not been branded correctly. They are too cheap. Uh, like like ma'am Sabina said that how many people uh, would hire people who've done an online course and the answer is nobody will hire them because they've done an online course. I, I hire 500 people uh, and uh, uh, the whole idea is and I did a, f for the first time in my life I did an online course on how to be a YouTuber uh, after 25 years. The one part that I felt was that the value of the course is too cheap so in the mind of the uh, employer it is the, the fact that what would you have learned because the course is so cheap. The second thing that I don't understand about the edu education sector is that why are they not branding online education because they can make a lot more money uh, because uh, they can teach a lot more people by branding it and marketing it correctly. I don't think enough marketing dollars are being spent on uh, branding the online courses correctly. And lastly, why don't you offer a difference difference in education also maybe like what what you have in phones or in clothes for example you can get some different types of clothes on amazon which you won't get in the retail store right so maybe some additional stuff that is provided in the online uh, course which will not be available uh, if you're going to a particular school 
uh, which would attract more people and those will be more relevant for employability. Uh, now, I, I run a data analytics company in the real estate sector. Now, uh, can you imagine it's going to be 16% of the GDP by 2030. It's the highest employment generator in the country and it has not even one good school. I've hired over 600 people and one of my employees is the CEO of the number one uh, company Godrej Properties in India. So I know and I recruit sure. from the best schools and the best schools are not like IITs or IIMs in the real estate sector. So the quality of education is so poor over there that I get tired teaching all these people in research and consulting yeah. and analytics and there's no value of it. So Thank these you. are two different questions. So who'd like to respond? Hmm. Yeah. So his question is that... The you, first okay. question was the branding. Yeah. The pricing, pricing and the marketing of mm -hmm. online courses is not being done correctly according to me. Yeah. And that's why people don't value it. <coughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I, I actually, do, I think that people are not responding because it doesn't work. That's, that's my simple response. And l let, me, let me qualify that, let me qualify yeah. that. So first I think, um, I'm going to just take a step back really quickly and make a few points. First is, I think research now reflects, without a doubt, that technology has seriously dangerous effects on mental health and cognition of children. Okay. So no matter what we want to say about ed tech, we can't deny that. The second thing, and I'm sorry, Shashank, for bringing this up again, but I want to go back to the medical example. because. Many of you have probably experienced going to a doctor not knowing what you have and, and having a conversation with the doctor to get some kind of a diagnosis only to find out a week later that maybe that wasn't the right diagnosis and maybe it's a different diagnosis, right? Um, you know, a lot of the medical profession, no matter how sophisticated the virtual reality equipment is, it's good for training, absolutely. Sophisticated, less sophisticated, it's good for training. But at the end of the day, even in the medical profession, so much of it is subjective. It's based on different bodies, different people with cancer. I mean, we don't, you know, I have a, unfortunately have had a lot of relatives with cancer and it's really doctors t making subjective judgments about what kind of therapy, how much of the chemotherapy, how much radiation, how long. There's not, it's not prescriptive. It's very subjective based on the doctor that decides. Uh, in, in engagement with the patient. So this kind of human contact is indispensable and also in education. Now, if there's a problem with not enough teachers or quality of teachers, let's work on that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we also raised the issue of the novelty of, of, of uh, uh, sorry, we raised the, raised the issue of excitement of kids. Well, that's because technology is new, but if we introduce it uniformly everywhere, to, sorry, Get it out of my way now. If we if we um, if we introduce technology widespread, right, it becomes less exciting. It becomes less exciting. The novelty, that excitement, even is gone. Uh, the the last point I wanted to make, actually, which is uh, more in response to you, is ed tech. We're talking a lot about ed tech and learning, which I think you know. I have very strong views about. I, again, technology is not bad, but I really appreciated Shikhar's example of when you bring it to schools, it works. When you send people home with it and say, do it on your own, it doesn't work, right? Because that's human-assisted technology, and that works. But I think the other very important dimension of ed tech is that it's a business, right? It's a for-profit business, a for-profit business that is financed by venture capital and private equity investors. I'm thinking, can I, can I say, is this off the record or on the record? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say Baiju's, right? Everyone's heard of Baiju's. Now, th now this is a for-profit platform. Investors have an incentive to invest in a large portfolio of companies right at the startup stage so they'll they'll you know invest in several companies knowing that only one or two or three of them might succeed and a majority of them would fail right now how and i'll bring this back to education and learning and and ed tech uh, and the application of ed tech how many people do you know i know several in in urban slums in villages 
that have been have bought into this idea that they can actually buy tutoring, online tutoring for their kids to give them, you know, an edge in schooling or an edge in the board exams or an edge in whatever other, uh, you know, civil um, service exams, etc. And and then the the platform has gone out of business, right? Because the whole model is set up that of those ten that investors invest in, eight of them will die. And what about all their clients? What about all those parents and children that have bought into these platforms and online tutoring that now have nowhere to go? So one aspect of ed tech is the impact on learning and the mental health and the cognitive development of children. The other aspect is the business of ed tech, which is actually quite a scary business. And I, I would extend that to platforms in general. It's not just ed tech, it's platforms in general. Also, last thing, and then I'm done. Anupama, I think it's really interesting that you bought a physical model to show us, <laughs> right? Yes, of course. And that kids yes, would course. like touch and feel and look at yeah. this. Yes. You cannot replace that by a two-dimensional screen. No. Yeah. You can buy a 3D model, which gets very exciting because then you can uh, change it. So what we do is that we give this to them. So this is how original Humpy is, and that's how it must have been. Yeah. So we actually ask them and show a digital model and ask them to recreate what it may have been, and they come up with different ideas. So again, what you're doing is that you are making them think creatively. So a uh, digital model does help <laughs> because physical will take about 48 hours. This takes about 48 hours to 3D print. So I don't think we could really work. So I, I have wanted to just- I just have to clarify uh, one thing. Uh, I, Sami, I, I, I don't want to have it as a back and forth. Let's, let's get responses and then move on a bit. I just yeah. want to say he was talking of that there are not enough branding. I think there's not enough regulation as well. Branding, marketing to hair because those people have money and they are people like uh, who are made a business of online uh, courses and there are but there is I don't know if you know about Diksha and Swayam please do find out there are government uh, MOOC courses which is Swayam and there is Diksha which is again offered as a portal and a, a, a place for digital learning and these are content uh, regulated uh, and validated whereas uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, so marketing and branding would be good for online courses but most important, as she said, they have to be first regulated as well because you don't know what content is being put out and who's making money out of it. Uh, just by you know saying that this is an online course, sahi bhi hai ya nahi? Who knows? Yeah. Question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to ask Shikhar this question because uh, you run, you know, you're at the head and at the helm of fantastic schools. Which student, in your opinion, is smarter? The ones from my generation who knew all the phone numbers on their fingertips or the ones today who have AI and VR and everything else and are exposed. So who's smarter? I hope you vote for us. <laughs> I think um, it would not be very smart of me to even attempt that <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. But I'll, t I'll tell you one thing, there are in every generation and why limit it to us? Because I spent a lot of time with my grandmother who was 88, okay? So she was, by the way, she, I was telling her the other day that she may be one of the few handful of people alive that met Mahatma Gandhi, okay? Because she's 88 years old and she did meet him. But I like what she says, which is different to, so the way that she critical thinks is different to the way my parents do it and the way my kids do it. And so my, and you know, you've, and, and, and you've heard this phrase maybe before and I, and I think it, it makes total sense that uh, you know the the elder the elder believe everything, the middle aged doubt everything, and the young know everything, <laughs> right? And it doesn't change because if I dial back twenty years ago, I was exactly like that, right? I'm getting into the doubt everything <laughs> stage, okay? But I certainly started out knowing, thinking that I know everything. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's ever going to change. I think the generation after them is always going to think that they know more, <laughs> and it's just that they have so much access to information, just beating us hollow with information. But that's just the way it is. That's life. So you had a question. Uh, th uh, thank you. Myself, Keshav. Uh, I was working with an ad tech uh, earlier, and right now I'm working with uh, uh, NGO is working for <coughs> education sector. So I have a question in relation with about problem and solution dilemma. So we have a problem in our education system, and that's why we come up with a solution called startups. And the startups are ad tech. So we have a problem, things are not moving in my class and lots of the things are theoretical yeah. nature. So we have a screen, now things are moving and things are audio as well. Next problem we have, sometimes we have some issues, we are not able to go in class and we can now go into Zoom sessions. Still the lecture has been made. 
maybe we have a problem. I can't see the actual monument. So we have this miniatures of yours, ma'am. But now we have three problems solved with these three big industries who have a great money in them and they can market, they can brand themselves, they can add sense me, they can collect my data, change my narratives, change my thinking and make me understand this is a thing I want to buy from this type of startup. So they solve a problem, but they create new ones. For example, early, earlier, ma'am, you said about mental health. So my mental health, <coughs> it was when I was in 2021, when I was a master's student of anthropology, COVID happened. I'm not able to study because of Zoom or because of startups, because of edtech. I have my lessons learned. But there's one thing I lost. I'm not able to make a connection with my professor. Just after my master's, I'm not able to connect with him. If I have to publish a research paper, I have to travel all the back to my Chandigarh University over there, Punjab University, and make him a connection. Because he won't pick up my phone. We don't have that connection, yeah. which my seniors had. Mm. Or maybe uh, the Zoom sessions. Earlier, my, my focus was the teacher. I'm only seeing him. I'm only starting from his gestures. Now he's just secondary for me. I'm learning from this screen over there, which I can learn even while sitting in the home. Why should I even come bother to study in school? Why should I even go for there? Why should I even make a connection? Or I can say, why should I become a social being again when I can just sit in a room and do my things over there? Like ma'am said, my generation, your generation. So I want to add on this. Your generation has created AI. My generation is capable of just using it. I am able to use multiple data analytics, multiple courses, multiple knowledges. But the question is still same. Am I able to create it one day? Yeah. So my question to you, a panelist here, EdTech solves a problem, but creates a new one. Absolutely. That's why we had EdTech to solve a problem, but they created a new one. So it's like a cycle for me. When this cycle comes on the <laughs> part where we have solution for education. True. So we, we are going to, we, yeah. Um, over to you, Jagjit. Yeah. Hi, thank you for that fantastic question. So uh, I would bring this down to the philosophy of education and on how we learn, right? So we as humans essentially learn by connection with each other. This is how we survive in this world. Like it is, you know, through our communication that we kind of sense other people and learn that. And going from there, when we talk about education, EdTech industry has essentially reduced education to skills, and education is not only skills. You know, uh, your interaction with the humans. So, uh, you know, I have graduated from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and at our university, uh, the teachers say that we, uh, in this modern world, in the language of modernity and rationality that we now speak, because everything is reason, right? Reason is something that we sell. So in the name of EdTech also, we are sell. For instance, if you are talking about business in ad tech, we are saying, yeah, this sells more, so let's go by this. In this age of modernity, the language of intuition has taken a back step. And that is a very important, uh, you know, element of being a human. And that is what, you know, uh, our teachers reinvented when they taught us. So uh, ad tech, or for, for that matter, any technology uh, should not take this core away from us. And even if we are planning and we are moving ahead in the age of modernity, post-modernity, and you know, development of technologies, which we can't you know, now stop, we should not forget that we are humans first. And this is how we live, and this is how we learn. So if we are trying to develop some solution, it, this should be the core, rather than you know, kind of being, I think we are being fooled by the fact that technology can bring us more business. Technology kind of can help us solve problems. Technology can be the next, you know, hopeful thing. None of that is working in the Western world as well. And, you know, I observe schools uh, in the UK as well. So the way they use technology is very different from the way, you know, kind of we are valorizing it right now. So we need to, I think, rethink on selling our belief, uh, you know, to the technology and it becoming almost like a religion to us, which is now happening in our world. So uh, I'll just add one more point to you as well. I think your question comes from 
uh, approaching ed tech through a business uh, you know venture and that's how you want to uh, you know kind of look at ed tech so uh, i would say that probably uh, you know the way you because since you haven't seen the realm of education the way you would look at education uh, would would or might completely change once you start interacting with one more educationist at the university level and that would kind of help you venture better in the field even you know even if you want to go ahead with the business thank you questions um gentlemen here thank you uh I am from a university and uh, I also have worked in corporate and kind of a, an interesting discussion and just three things come to my mind. I'm just thinking aloud with you. But, uh, I think my belief is that what we are seeing in ed tech or AI, uh, especially in the education domain, is that we are trying to bring in technology uh, and try and kind of fit into the context and the way we have been teaching in the past. And and our education past has actually not gone through big changes. You know, a lot of things have changed. Uh, education overall hasn't changed. There's a teacher, there's a student, there's a classroom. You go there, you spend 12 to 15 years of your life learning, then you go and work, kind of a thing. Now that is a big paradigm within which we are bringing in net tech, we're bringing in technology. But life is not going to remain the same. I think we all recognize that. So what I'm trying to say is that what you teach how you teach and when you teach, this is going to go through a big change. And as this goes through a big change, technology would also have to go the same way. I mean, today we are putting technology and tech in the old paradigm. The paradigm is going to change. That's one, one belief that I have. Second, I think, is that like any technology, it could start at a very, very crude level. And we all would have used BlackBerry in 2003, four, the kind of cameras we had was like shitty cameras, not tech. But today, do we use the cameras? I mean, do we use the other SLRs? We don't. Something similar probably will happen to ed tech, AI, or technology in education, that suddenly one day we will just find, oh wow, this meets the, the right requirements of, of the learning part. Today, we don't see, we are seeing a big difference between what learning is required or uh, what is required from technology for learning, it's not meeting it. And that's why we are f uh, not really giving it that credence or we're seeing too many problems. But once it comes close to it and then replaces what we are used to as a schools, industry, uh, universities, that's when we'll find the big disruption. I mean, that's my belief. Uh, I've seen it with cameras, which is simple enough for us to relate to, but if we look at any other thing, even medical, Science yeah. is going through big change. Can I, I give yeah. you, can I ask a question? I'll just give you an example. My view of edtech is not content. Okay, we are obsessed, I think, with content. Thinking edtech means content. It's not. There is a whole universe of edtech solutions well beyond simply content. I agree. A teacher putting on, uh, you know, a video and playing it and thinking that's uh, that's not going to result in anything. But if People are in this space and they're serious about it. There's some incredible tools out there. I'll give you a simple case in point, right, right in my house. So um, my son is incredible. He's seven years old. He's just, in, so he's probably the most advanced in his class in, in a small cohort in math, but he's way behind in language. And so um, in reading, so I kept trying to understand and they said, well, you know, he's in line with the cohort. I said, well, I understand that. But if he's intellectually bright enough to be ahead in one subject, what is holding him back in another subject? And so I kept, you know, spending time with him to read, and you know, he'd get dissuaded. He said, "I don't, I don't want to read it." So I said, "Okay, fine. Let me try to do an assessment with him." So I got this tool. I did this assessment, and it was a really straightforward assessment. What the assessment basically told me was that there were particular sounds that he was confusing, and that was dissuading him, and he just felt like he didn't want to read the entire thing. I showed that assessment to the teacher. We worked collaboratively. She was completely open-minded about it. And we addressed those particular uh, nuggets where he, was, uh, where he wasn't able to read. He wasn't able to read even one page. And in two months, he's now reading a book of about 25, 30 pages, right? Imagine you multiply that with 2,000 kids, okay? And you tell me that there is no value in ed tech. Now, I'm if you have that. 
I, I yeah. completely buy no, it. No, no, I, I, yeah, I, I'm I, saying I'll it just, to general I, people, right? No, so I, I, I'm not uh, disputing it. Yeah, yeah. So no. those, those, I mean, just incredibly valuable tools because I know, so I know how every student is behaving, right? I've got the, uh, but, uh, but of course, you're supposed to bring a human element. If, if you're blinded by that as just a pure diagnosis and you don't apply that, it's like using any technology out there, right? But the point is that it was just magic, okay? Because when I saw that, I said, you know, I'm, th I'm visualizing basically, how do, you, how do you expand this, right? And then how do you expand it at the back end? You don't, sh you don't showcase it, you know, the whole point is you don't advertise this thing, hum bhi at tech hai, right? <laughs> Which is the problem, right? Yeah. So, th so that's, you know, I guess we get a little obsessed about it and it's used very differently in the West, I think, as uh, Jagdeep was saying, as to what it is in India. In India, we've been brainwashed its content yeah. and it's obviously not. Agreed. And I'll just put one one more thing. Yeah, very quickly. Because Is it be possible? Today we still see uh, somebody who is in graduated from seventh grade to eighth grade must meet these these standards. So you basically put, can it happen? A student is said you are physics, you are in tenth standard, but in history you are in fifth standard. Can that kind of so a it's already happening? Yeah. It's already so happening. So that's that's it's where I happening. think the ed tech uh, exactly. Uh, that's yeah. the corollary of so thing. Yeah. How do you allow it to? Can we? It's, yeah. it's not limited to, to students, by the way. Adults uh, have <laughs> the same <Yeah>. problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Questions? Anybody? Uh, there's a gentleman at the back. Tool. He's asking. Can we take that offline? There's a gentleman at the back, please. Yeah. Um, can uh, Can we have the gentleman at? The, yeah. I'm M.B. Chandar from nknewsindia.com. 70% of India lives in villages. Every 60 kilometer dialect changes. Right to education policy, it was introduced 12 years back. Hardly 3% is implemented. There are so many dropouts. And as it was said, during the COVID time, 1% one person, one person remotest area got this access to some technology. How many were denied? That you did not say. How many they have access to these technologies? How many are denied with these technologies? You are not counting that. Whatever things you are talking, it is catering hardly to one or two percent of the population of India. Could you ha comment on this? Uh, would anyone like to comment on that? Yeah. Come, Jagdeep. Yeah. So very right very rightly pointed out, technology is a class phenomena and we don't acknowledge it. And it is very much, uh, you know, in the urban spaces that we say that we will use technology and then, you know, in the name of access, we say we will kind of, um, you know, kind of proliferate this technology to the villages also, but it doesn't happen and, you know, that is mostly to, and the economists have recognized it that that is mostly to cut down the cost. So that's, I mean, I totally agree on what you are saying. So that 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 has to be addressed when we talk about technology, and it, it, it will kind of, you know, even after we, uh, even after ten years, we talk about uh, you know technology, that problem will stay because that is a class question. So that I think oh. SDG question. has to meet its own. So that's yeah. the sustainable. So the thing yeah. is, India has to address this. So even when you're saying education doesn't reach the remotest part of uh, the villages, medical also doesn't reach it. That is the problem that we do have. It has to be, so you're right, technology is only used by the people who have the tools to use the technology, no doubt. But what we are, I think, trying to say here is which positive ways can technology be used to aid reaching those you know, areas or making it easier. I'm not saying that make it more difficult for those people who are you know, in the remote parts, but you have to use technology in a better way. And I think that all the panelists agree that it cannot be just used for one thing that you know you probably have 3D printing, AR, VR. I don't think that probably people outside this room or even in this room even understand what they are. So uh, we are not, I think, encouraging that yeah. only know this. And, and, and just to add a comment before I come take the next question, it was, for example, during COVID, one of the technologies that was remarkable in rural Udaipur was community radio, right, in little pockets. Yes. Now that's not very high tech. Once COVID, you know, went away, nobody, used it anymore because you know it, it was very low tech but it was tech all right and it actually got a lot of learning done in some of the tribal communities in Udaipur district so there are little pockets where you know it's, it's sometimes about using appropriate technology rather than the best technology right on it best in terms of the most high-tech technology and uh, 
um, um, if you look at the entire technology landscape as being broader than just the fanciest technology is the ultimate goal, right? Um, then you can actually match the access issue with the problem that you're trying to solve. And sometimes just pure community radio, one-way community radio, is solving a particular problem for a particular moment. And that's appropriate for that moment. Right. Um, question. Thank you. Um, so just taking a cue from Shikhar's point on rural penetration in terms of smartphones and yet the electricity being a problem. So when I was a young brand manager 20 years ago and I thought I knew everything, I realized that you know Unilever, uh, where we worked, had a 70% market share in rural. And we were launching shampoo sachets and we thought that one of the things we can do is put a television at our cost in every panchayat uh, sarpanch's house and get rural ads, the higher GRPs on rural ads, so that our consumption of our FMCG products would go up because we are market leaders. We had 70% market share. So we did this experiment in Madhya Pradesh and we put televisions in a lot of sarpanch houses. And we figured that the GRPs were getting wasted. The, the money we were spending, the ROI was negative because electricity wasn't there. And then we founded a hub and spoke model or a, a model of self-help groups where Shakti Ammas would go and uh, do on-ground activation to get Absolutely. our FMCG products. And sa shampoo sashes in 2005 was a very big phenomenon. We had just launched it to get them to everyone's houses. Now, uh, now my question is that, is there a hub and spoke train the trainer? I have two questions. Train the trainer model possible instead of learning going directly on the smartphone, which is passive learning and the electricity that Shikha pointed out, a very valid point. 20 years ago, we had the same problem. Uh, is going to be a concern in enabling reach and therefore impact. Is a hub and spoke model of learning possible or train the trainer model possible where you train the faculty uh, at these or teachers at these villages and then therefore they part impact uh, more effective training downwards? And the second question is proctored assessments. Uh, if you look at proctoring, and I've recently done some AWS yeah. sessions with my team, we have a technology team that works in APEC. And uh, we've been working with them on proctoring assessments remotely so that we're able to ensure that the validity and the credibility of the outcome is accurate. Uh, would that be possible remotely with, uh, uh, with rural villages as well? Uh, and therefore increasing the accuracy of the kind of reports we get out of that, the analytics that we get. Thank you, those are two questions. Would anyone like to take those? So uh, teaching the trainer, Arpit is one of the yeah. uh, efforts again yeah. on Swayam. So I think that is happening. How successful it is, I don't have any kind of parameters. So I mean, I can, I can address those questions if you'd like. I mean, that uh, uh, both those things that you talked about are actually, there are models out there right, on it. They're not perfect, but they are actually looking at solving for uh, rural communities. Uh, the problem becomes, as uh, everyone on the panel has pointed out, about uh, electricity, internet connectivity are big issues that you have to live with right on it. And so let me take your second one first about proctoring. So there's a solution. I won't, again, name it because that's not uh, important. This is a solution that relies on very little internet connectivity and very little electricity. Read on it. Now, um, and we can talk more about what that solution is. But that's a solution that works even if your internet is down through your entire assessment. Right? It doesn't need always on in bro broadband. Now, so again, it's about appropriate technologies. If you have a problem where you have intermittent internet, you've got to build that into your solution. You can't have a solution that relies on always on internet when your reality is that you don't have always on internet. Train the trainer is not about technology. It's about incentives. Yeah. So yeah. you have to get that aligned. That's Absolutely. not aligned. There's no technology in the world that's going to save you. Yeah. Yes, please. So I'll just share an example with you on what you're asking. So Tata Institute of Social Science Mumbai works a lot on ed tech, you know, in the rural areas. And once at a panel, they said that when they go to the rural areas, the problem is also that there is no technology. Like electricity is one issue, obviously, but there is no technology. So the solution to that, what they said was, you know, uh, bring your own device, which means, you know, there is no, uh, you know, uh, kind of, accessibility of laptops, et cetera. So whatever you have, you bring it, you know, to the classroom or wherever the learning center is, and we'll find out, you know, how we work with that. Now that also, you know, I'm reiterating it again, that also comes from the centrality that technology has taken in our minds. I mean, I mean I'm just trying to move this centrality away so that we can be more innovative in what we do with technology as well. 
right? So why yeah, don't we just yeah, get, yeah. you know, loosen this hold yeah. of technology that we are holding on to? There can be many multiple solutions other than technology as well. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm going to just uh, now pull it all together, mm. right? And last question with ma'am there, and then I'll bring it back to the panel to pull it all together. Uh, it's not a question, actually. Uh, just an observation or maybe my views on this. And I would like to start this with the title itself because it suggests what we are uh, uh, talking right now, that the revolution that is always arriving, it never arrives. So uh, you are equipped with one kind of uh, technology and then there is another kind of technology and you have to deal with this. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, that would be interesting because I, I, I think uh, uh, most of you are uh, from New Delhi. And uh, I am uh, 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 from Jharkhand. And uh, um, uh, how I am here is also very interesting because I just happened to be here uh, with, uh, to be with my daughter. I was having uh, holidays in my university, so I just thought to visit her. I just got to know about this program and because I teach, uh, so I thought that I should be here. And uh, uh, whatever you are talking right now, uh, you know, about uh, technology and how it is impacting. Uh, I can see that uh, the observation is uh, quite, um, uh, uh, quite uh, on, uh, on the, uh, uh, my idea uh, of uh, this uh, technology bringing into classroom uh, is uh, somehow where uh, both uh, the uh, student and teacher uh, uh, both have to negotiate uh, a bit. Uh, I would like to explain it uh, further. Like uh, for teachers, technology can be tool uh, to, to be a better teacher. And uh, for uh, a student, it can be a tool to be a better student. Because if we are thinking that uh, technology can replace a uh, teacher, that's not going to happen and that's not the correct way to look into it. Uh, that's what my observation is. Because classroom is just, just not, the, uh, uh, not the, the center of learning uh, in, in a way we think that content can be given and information can be given to the student because for content and information we have n number of youtube videos these days uh, we have n number of things uh, which are uh, available online uh, we have google we have now ai which is giving answers to the students and they can make notes and everything I believe that the kind of bonding he was talking about, the kind of compassion a teacher, uh, you know, gives to the teacher, and the kind of uh, subjective attitude, uh, you know, which we keep for these students. Because if you are, th they are in fun mood, you know, we change the method. If we believe that someone is uh, uh, affected because of some reason, you know, we change the method of teaching. So that uh, that can never happen in technology. And uh, when uh, students are going into university or college, it's not just about learning. Uh, learning uh, as far as this education or degree is concerned, but they also learn about how uh, we live collaboratively, the teamwork, the uh, kind of, yeah, we you are running out of yeah, time. Uh, yeah. we, no, so uh, I'm wondering if there's a question in there. That's, yeah, that's what uh, my thing No, is. My, uh, there was no question, but what no, I then was... Then, ma'am, I have to ask you to please stop. We'll yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would yeah. like to conclude by saying that uh, you, you, we discussed something, you know, here in uh, Delhi, and it reaches to Jharkhand and... Uh, Chhattisgarh and other kind of people, you know, it takes almost 10 years. So still our teachers are learning how to prepare PPT and you're talking about AI. So this difference has to go, uh, go down, you know, and this uh, difference has to, uh, uh, is something, you know, on which we have to work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to just start uh, winding it up uh, uh, with everyone and I'm going to ask you all for your, um, uh, for your final comments read on it and on focusing on uh, actually the title behind us is EdTech, including AI, the revolution that is always arriving and yet never arrives. And any other final comments you might have? Uh, I'll begin with you, Anupma, and work my way across. I think a lot of uh, what we discussed today, we kind of forget that we really in India have had traditional uh, uh, education systems which are Gurukul. I'll just go back to that I was about to say, which were all about very personalized uh, learning and teaching and being with the teacher and a human interface. And whether, you know, today we've come very far, we've come to the point where there is hybrid, we talk of hybrid learning, we talk of tools in tech and education. So, but that that one-to-one -one between teacher and uh, this thing will never go away. And edutech, edtech, 
you know, it has been completely what has happened uh, during the last few years is that tech, as she said, has been looked at more as a business and more as something that, you know, you're trying to uh, remove that aspect of teacher classroom, etc. I mean, they were not teacher and classroom initially. They were actually teacher and environments and students were with them there. That's I was just mentioning, going to mention that. So that it may or may not have arrived. See, you can't take away, uh, you can't really take away when there is advancement, whether it's in medical or in education, you can't take away. So we, years ago, I mean, I think when calculators came, we all now have forgotten how to calculate. We just take out our phone, it's become a calculator. Cameras are no more there. Initially, when I talk of, when I used to teach AI actually, to, you know, th so you are teaching machines to think you are bringing technology in education similarly. So first you forget how to calculate, then you forget how to remember numbers, then you forget how to, uh, uh, you know, maybe do search because everything Google does for you. You don't even jog your memories to do things. So this is happening, but then you are thinking in different ways. I think we are, we are becoming more equipped with skills we may not want, but we are, we have to survive and you do that. So how do you, you cannot stop anything from coming in technology from coming in you will have uh, cars which will drive themselves very soon you have you know yeah so you have you know it is there today and they will they will be mistakes you will be probably so how do you stop that yes in terms of edtech in india if you really look at it if it hadn't become more of a business and an online platform i think technology tools which he's talking of are more important and they have to come in so that awareness from people who've probably used them if he can spread that knowledge, I think we would all love to use those tools. And in terms of administration or not, I'm not very sure. But yes, uh, for school management, definitely needs to use. But for all students, what will always happen is any teacher who tells a good story or any online platform <laughs> which tells a good story and makes you, you know, interact is, is interactive will still be a good uh, uh, learning way to learn. That's all I want to say. Thank you. In 90 minutes, people have barely moved. Okay, so I think they obviously you find the topic to be really interesting. My concluding remark is have more of these Shashank. <laughs> every month, right? yeah. Uh, it's gonna happen every month, thank you. Savina. I, I don't have that skill of brevity. That's yeah. not true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have four, but hopefully quick points. Um, the first is a lot of people have brought up COVID and I, I would like to dispel the notion that children during COVID actually learned rem, uh, through their devices. Study after study post COVID has shown the learning loss in children that had to stay home while schools were closed for a better part of two, two and a half, almost three years. So let's just dispel with the myth that you know, edu that technology solved the COVID learning loss problem. It was actually research shows that that's not true. Uh, I also think that some of the solutions, the technology solutions that came up or solutions in big quotation marks that were used during COVID were compensate, comp I can't say the word, compensatory, Compens mm -hmm. were compensation, were compensation. That's not our gold standard. That's, that's, as Shashank said, a particular moment in time, a particular need, we availed technology. I was on Zoom. I much prefer and find the value of in-person meetings uh, over technology, right? So radio might have been a good solution for that particular moment. Is it really the best solution that we want to draw for all of education? Probably not, right? So that, and actually, uh, uh, Jagjit made that point to me as well. Uh, that's point number one. The second point I want to make is, just to your question, is you kind of put AI and ed tech together, Shashank, and yep. I would like to separate them because I think AI has very many applications and it, 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 is, it has arrived, right? We need to regulate it. There are good things. There are more bad things, I think, than good things but it has arrived and will continue to evolve. EdTech, however, has this business dimension that I talked about, and I think that's a whole different beast. So I, I can't, I don't think we can, so to this question, will it arrive? 
I don't think so, uh, not in the way, I don't think it's gonna arrive by itself. I think if we explore it as a tool, as with a very strong human interface facilitated by teachers, then yes, we might use ed tech more, but it's not going to be a phenomenon that replaces education through people and, and the human interface. Uh, which brings me to my third point, which is exactly what I just said. Learning is a social human process, period. End of story. And finally, I just wanted to pick up uh, on my fourth point, which is to, to what you said. It creates solutions, but it also creates problems, right? So mental health and cognition, there's enough research to show the mental health problems in children that, that, uh, that technology is affecting cognition. It's also to the person in the back, I think he's gone now, but it is exacerbating inequality. There's people that have access and people that don't. Right, uh, in villages where where you know I said 26 percent. This is in general 26 percent of women uh, use mobile internet. Um, many of those women actually you know might have a mobile phone, but they don't actually get to really use it because their children are using it or it's their brothers. Or, right. So anyone that goes to Begusarai or does field work in urban slums or rural areas knows this. So there's a lot of problems. It's not just a matter of giving people devices or giving people access to power or giving people, it's, there's a lot of social consequences around how to, who uses technology, how it's used. Research also shows that young people that use mobile phones are, and mobile internet are actually using it for entertainment purposes and not learning or, right, a majority use it for entertainment, not learning or um, jobs. So, I mean, let's, you know, let's get into the details because the devil's always in the details. So I think to sum up my own position, I think ed tech, I, I think tech, not ed tech, I think tech is a powerful tool, but it has to have, and it can be an enabler, but we need to distinguish between administrative when it comes to education and learning. I don't think it's a good tool by itself for learning. I'll stop there, thank you. Jagji. So I'll just give two to three points. Um, we can't get away from technology. It is a gift of modernity that has now been given to us. We will move ahead with that. And that is how the world has been moving in the unilinear you know, direction that we keep questioning, but that's how it is, right? So we will not be able to get away from even ed tech. We should know it. But we should try and kind of uh, you know, think around it and kind of, you know, uh, not place it at the center to be more innovative with it. That's what, you know, is my first point. Then uh, I think machines in itself were invented to help us as humans. So they shouldn't be replacing us. The language that we speak today, you know, in terms of AI and, you know, things kind of replicating humans can't be done. In fact, those things have repercussions for our, you know, psychological, social existence, and we should be wary of that. And that would happen. I mean, doctors have st started talking about it, like Sabina is saying. So we must look at, you know, those consequences in terms of what ed tech also entails. And lastly, uh, there's a professor, very old professor, once told me, in education, technology cannot solve any problem that we haven't been able able to do otherwise. So if there are less teachers, you cannot solve that through technology. That will never happen. And similarly goes for other things as well. So we should probably you know, think more innovatively in terms of the solutions that we come up in the realm of education rather than only ed tech. Thank you. Well, uh, it comes to me to um, do two things. One, to of course thank all of you, uh, the panelists, and all of you in the audience for being here today read on it, um, and that's the welcome task that I have. And my only final words would be, I hope you're going away better informed than when you came in, read on it. I think the decisions about whether ed tech is this magical solution or this devil, or if it's somewhere in between, if AI is with us, if it's dangerous, or if it's gonna be useful, I leave those decisions to you, right? But I just hope that you do go away better informed, right? And go away with thoughts in your mind that are going to help you question the decisions you take relating to education, education technology, and AI. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
before before you step down i'll just on behalf of iit thank you the panelists uh, for this discussion thank you hot advisors shashank malvika rupam the whole team i think the program fulfills a critical component in our programming every month today was the inaugural session uh, we have the next session on 31st october it's going to be even more in, uh, interesting it's called the blind side of uh, wim of women, of in, science, women right. in science and uh, scientific inquiry so do be there for that do inform your friends just two notes uh, we have an annotated bibliography on the ihc website which is to be read before the sessions if you're interested we will also be carrying key takeaways uh, for after the session a recording of this session will be on the habitat youtube channel for some of your friends who've missed it so do share widely and don't miss it next month we have programming for the next 6 months so please be there and thank you for coming <laughs>